Hello, happy Friday everyone. How's your days been? I started my day with Joe Wicks's PE uh, class, which was lots of fun. Get the heart, heart racing and a bit of motivation for the day. Um, so I went on an evening walk uh, last night. Uh, it was nice as the sun was coming down and just seeing everything coming into bloom in people's front gardens. Uh, and I spotted 24 rainbows in people's windows, which was a really nice activity to do walking, walking through. Have any of you made any rainbows to put in your windows to spread a bit of happiness and smiles? Let us know. Uh, some of you sent us some pictures of the ones that you did on Instagram, which was really nice to see uh, you getting involved and uh, spreading the love. So we are ready for chapter two of Maya the Bee. Are you sitting comfortably? Uh, here we go. So chapter two, the house of the rose. By the time Maya awoke, it was full of daylight. She felt a little chilly under her big green leaf and stiff in her limbs so that her first, mo first movements were slow and clumsy. Clinging to a vein of the leaf, she let her wings quiver and vibrate to limber them up and shake off the dust. She then smoothed her fair hair and wiped her large eyes clean and crept warily down to the edge of the leaf where she paused and looked around. The glory and the glow of the morning sun were dazzling. Though Maya's resting place lay in cool shadow, the leaves overhead shone like green gold. Oh, you glorious world, thought the little bee. Slowly, one by one, the experiences of the previous day came back to her. All the beauty she had seen and all the risks she had run she remained firm in her resolve not ret to return to the hive. To be sure, when she thought of Cassandra, her heart beat fast. Though it was not very likely that Cassandra would find her, no, no. To her, there was no joy in forever, forever having to fly in and out of the hive, carrying honey and mixing wax. This was clear once and for all. She wanted to be happy and free and enjoy her life in her own way. Come what might, she would take the consequences. The truth being that she had no real idea of things that lay in store for her. Far off in the sunshine, something glimmered red. A lurking impatience seized the little bee. Moreover, she felt hungry. So with a loud, joyous buzz, she swung out of her hi hiding place into the clear, glistening air and the warm sunlight and made straight for the red patch that seemed to nod and beacon. When she drew near, she smelled a perfume so sweet that it almost robbed her of her senses. <laughs> and she was hardly able to reach the red flower. She let herself down on her uttermost of its careful, curved petals and clung to it tightly. At the gentle tipping of the petal, a shining silver sphere, almost as big as herself, came rolling towards her, transparent and gleaming in all the colours of the rainbow. Maya was dreadfully frightened, yet fascinated too by the splendour of the cool silver sphere which rolled by her. Balanced on the edge of her petal, leapt into the sunshine and fell down into the grass. Oh! Oh! The beautiful ball had shivered into a score of wee pearls. Maya uttered a little cry of terror. <laughs> but the tiny round fragments made such a bright, lively glittery in this grass and ran down the blades in such twinkling, sparkling little drops like diamonds in the lamp, uh, lamplight that she was reassured. A little beetle, a little smaller than herself, with brown wings and a black breastplate, was sitting at the entrance. He 
kept his place and looked up at her seriously, though by no means admir oh, admirably. Maya bowed politely. Did the ball belong to you? she asked. And receiving no reply, added, I'm so very sorry that I threw it down. Do you mean the drew drop? smiled the beetle, rather superior. You needn't worry about that. I had taken a drink already, and my wife never drinks water. She has kidney trouble. What are you doing here? What is this wonderful flower? asked Maya, not answering the bee's question, be be beetle's question. Would you be good enough to tell me its name? Remembering Cassandra's advice, she was polite as possible. The beetle moved his shiny head, and a thing he could he could do easily without least com com discomfort, as his head fitted loop perfectly and gilded back and forth without a click. You seem to be only of yesterday, he said, and laughed, not very politely. <laughs> Although there was something about him that struck Maya as unrefined. The bees had more culture and better manners, yet he seemed to be a good-natured fellow, because seeing Maya's blush of embarrassment, he softened to her childness, childish ignorance. It's a rose. He explained. So now you know. We moved in four days ago, and since we moved in, it has flourished wonderfully under our care. Won't you come in? Maya hesitated, then conquered her misgrievings and took a few steps forward. He pressed aside a bright petal. Maya entered, and she and the beetle walked beside each other through the narrow, narrow chambers with the subdued light and fragrant walls. What a charming home, explained Maya, genuinely, take, genuinely taken by the place. The perfume is positively intoxicating. Maya's admiration pleased the beetle. It takes wisdom to know where to live, he said, and smiled good-naturedly. Tell me where you live, and I'll tell you what you're worth, says the old says the old beetle. Would you like some nectar? Oh, Maya burst out. I'd love some. The beetle nodded and disappeared by one of the many walls. Maya looked about. She was happy. She pressed her cheeks and her little hands against the dainty red hangings and took deep breaths of the delicious perfume. In an ecstasy of delight at being permitted to stop in such a beautiful dwelling. It certainly is a great joy to be alive, she thought. And there's no compar comparison between the dingy crowded stories in which the bees live and work and this house. The very quiet here is splendid. Suddenly there was a loud sound of scolding behind the walls. It was the beetle growing excitedly in great anger. He seemed to be hustling and pushing someone along roughly and Maya caught the following in a clear piping full voice of fright and mortification. Of course, because I'm alone, you dare to lay hands on me. But wait and see what you get when I bring my associates along. You are a ruffian. Very well, I am going. But remember, I called you a ruffian. You'll never forget that. The stranger's tone was so sharp and vicious. It frightened Maya dreadfully. In a few moments, she heard the sound of someone running out. The beetle returned and suddenly flung down some nectar. An outrage, he said. You can't escape those vermin anywhere. They don't allow you a moment's peace. Maya was so hungry, she forgot to thank him and took a mouthful of nectar and chewed. While the beetle wiped the perspiration from his forehead, and slightly loosened his upper armour as to catch his breath. Hmm, who was that? mumbled Maya with her mouth still full. Please empty your mouth. Finish chewing and swallow the nectar. One can't understand a word you say. Maya observed, but the excited owner of the house gave her no time to repeat her question. It was an ant! He burst out angrily. 
do those ants think we save and store up our hour after hour for them? The idea of going right to the pantry with that, how do you do or buy your leave? It makes me furious. If I didn't realise that the ill-mannered creatures actually didn't know better, I wouldn't hesitate a second to call them thieves. At this, he suddenly remembered his own manners. Oh, I beg your pardon, he said, turning to Maya. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Peter, one of the family of rose beetles. My name is Maya, said the little shy bee. I am delighted to make your acquaintance. She looked at Peter closely. He was bowing repeatedly and spreading his feelers like two little brown fans that pleased Maya Im immensely. You have the most fan fan uh, fascinating blah, blah, feelers, she said. Simply sweet. Well, yes, observed Peter, flattered. People do think a lot of them. Would you like to see the other side? If I may. The rose beetle turned his fan-shaped feelers to one side and let a ray of sunshine glide over them. Great, don't you think? he asked. I shouldn't have thought anything like them possible, rejoined Maya. My own feelers are very plain. Well, yes, observed Peter. To each to their own, by way of compensation, you certainly have a beautiful have beautiful eyes and the colour of your body, the gold of your body, is not to be sneezed at. Maya beamed. Peter was the first person to help tell her she had any good looks. Life was great. She was happy as a lark and helped herself to some more nectar. An excellent quality of honey, she remarked. Take some more, said Peter, rather amazed by his little guest's appetite. Rose juice of the first vintage. One has to be careful and not spoil one's stomach. There's some dew left too, if you're thirsty. Thank you very much, said Maya. I'd like to fly now, if you will permit me. The rose beetle laughed. <laughs> flying? Always flying, he said. It's in the blood of you bees. I don't understand such a restless way of living. There's some advantage in staying one place too, don't you think? Peter held the red curtain aside. I'll go as far as your observation petal with you, he said. It makes an um, observation petal with you, he said. It makes an excellent place to fly from. Oh, thank you, said Maya. I can fly from anywhere. That's where you have the advantage over me, replied Peter. I have some difficulty in folding my lower wings. He shook her hand and held the last curtain aside for her. Oh, the blue sky, rejoiced Maya. Goodbye. So long, cried Peter, remaining on the top petal to see Maya rise rapidly straight up to the sky in the golden sun and the clear, pure air of the morning. With a sigh, he returned, pensive, to his cool, rose dwelling. For, th for though it was still early, he was feeling rather warm. He sang his morning song to himself, and it hummed in the red sheen of the petals and the radiance of the spring day that slowly mounted and spread over the blossoming earth. Gold and green, a field and a tree, warm in the summer's glow. All is bright and fair to see while the roses blow what or why the world may be who can guess or know all the world is glad and free while the roses blow brief they say by time of glee with the roses i go yes but life is good to me while the roses blow and that's the end of chapter two hope you enjoyed it we'll see you soon